This is the third time I'm beginning this tape on the same subject. My dog, uh, since he was a puppy, has taken up residence under my desk where I work. And today he's an 80-pound Labrador, and he's apparently having a nightmare. And I've tried to wake him up. That's not going to happen. So I'm going to read this, and if you hear a dog go, yeah, you'll know, you know, live with it. Anyway, let's talk about Eat'em Up Jack McManus. He was born in Boston in 1862, and he became known as, and this is during the Gilded Age when New York was a tough place, a really tough place. He became known as the toughest man in New York, and it is true. I checked it out. Um, and that's how the papers referred to him. Anyway, his brother, I, he's an interesting guy, but I just want to stop, pause for a minute, talk about his brother, who was Kid McManus. These guys were the sons of Irish immigrants, the McManus brothers. You have to understand, during the Gilded Age, people were making enormous fortunes. And most of these fortunes, these people who are very respectable families now, were made on crime, just a higher class of crime. You could advertise that you're starting up a railroad if you had the right credentials and you were going to allow people to buy into it. Well, you sold worthless stock. There was no railroad. Or you built a railroad and never put money into it and it collapsed. And then you made off with the money. Banks were unstable. Businesses were unstable. Uh, there were really no, per se, government agencies to, to combat this sort of thing. So what happened was a lot of people bought safes. It was the in thing, massive, big, huge safes that they put in their homes. And it was a chic thing as well. You know, if another rich guy came over, you said, well, there's my safe. How's your safe? That sort of thing. And what grew up was an industry of breaking into safes. Kid McManus was known in Europe and the U.S. as a top-notch safe cracker. He really did some, uh, honestly, really remarkable things. Um, I'm going to go back and read some more about it. I won't bore you with it, but it does need to be noted. He was far more interesting than his brother, Eat Him Up Jack, who, who was not boring either. Eat Him Up Jack started out as a lightweight prize fighter, uh, but he drank a lot by his own admission, way too much beer, and he got a weight problem, and he eventually gave it up. He became a sheriff. That didn't work. Made his way down to New York and became a bouncer in some of the toughest dives, these saloons in the Bowery, uh, the Tivolia. And listen to this. is a, They actually did call this place McGurk's Suicide Hall. If you look in the newspapers of the day, it's not just McGurk's. It's McGurk's Suicide Hall. So interesting. Um, these places were the Bowery today, you can just drive by. It's, you know, you really don't notice anything about it. It's, uh, it's just the Bowery, but in its day, in those days, it was a dangerous, nasty, nasty place. You could get murdered walking down the street in the Bowery. It was really bad. Anyway, uh, they said that after McMahon had worked in these places for just a few years, his two front teeth were missing. He was a patchwork of wounds and welts and scars. Uh, there was one scar that ran from ear to ear, under his throat, ear to ear, under his throat, uh, at least until someone chewed off one of the ears. So, But the scar was still there. Anyway, he came to the attention of this guy named Paul Kelly. Paul Kelly was an Italian immigrant, despite the name, a very powerful gang leader. And a lot of Johnny Torrio came out of Paul Kelly's gang. He sees Edom Up Jack and he says, I got to hire this guy. He's going to be a bouncer at Kelly's Places, uh, the Little Naples Cafe, and the New Brighton Hall, which was another bucket of blood place. So he's in the New Brighton one night, and this guy, listen to this name. So we've got Edom Up Jack, and um, who else do we have here? Kid McManus, and now we've got another name, Chick Tricker, who worked for a guy named Jack Siroca. He was in Siroca's gang. He eventually became partners with Siroca. Tricker's drunk and he wanders. I don't know if that was his name. I couldn't find him on Ancestry.com. So I suspect he it's just not his real name. But he's drunk. He wanders into the bar, into New Brighton, and he gropes some of the showgirls. And, of course, McManus tosses him out on his butt. And when he does, Tricker says, I'll tell you what, tough guy. I can't fight you. You're better than I am. Let's see what you're made of. I'll meet you tonight on 3rd Avenue under the L, under the elevated train. So McManus says, sure. I don't know why this guy offered to do this because McManus shows up, pulls out a pistol. Tricker's already got his pistol off, and he shoots Tricker twice in the leg and just walks away. While he's walking away, Tricker's swearing revenge. The next night, uh, Eat'em Up Jack is standing on a corner. I have it here someplace. Oh, Bleaker in the Bowery. Bleaker in Bowery. And he's with a guy named Kid Griffo or Young Griffo. Uh, Kid Griffo... 
was the first featherweight boxing champion in the world, 1890, 1892. And he was probably, according to Ring Magazine, the first recognized champion boxer in any category. He, uh, I was going to tell you more about him, but I, I don't know if you're interested. He, he had a sad life uh, after the ring. Uh, he got taken advantage of a lot and so forth. But anyway, um, Eat 'em Up Jack is there, and him and Griffo are standing in the corner. This other, listen to this name, Sardinia Frank walks up. He's got a lead pipe filled with cement uh, hidden in a rolled up newspaper. And he walks up behind Eat 'em Up Jack, cracks him in the head, and breaks his skull, and he kills him. So that kicks off a gang, gang war between Paul Kelly, Jack Soroka. <sighs> That was the fuse that that lit the fuse, but really it was it was good. This gang war is going to happen no matter what at some point. The problem was Siroka had been Paul Kelly's lieutenant, and then he felt he wasn't going anywhere, and he saw other people rising ahead, so he left and he went to work for the Eastman Gang. Both of these gangs, the Five Points and the Eastman Gang, these were huge, powerful criminal organizations. I've heard that the uh, the five points went point numbered in the thousands. I don't think that's true. They they numbered four, five, six hundred probably. Um, the reason they f grew so quick is the same reason they fell apart. There were a lot of immigrants, Irish, Jews, Italians, who kids who were frantic, desperate in slums. We don't have that sort of slum today. We've cleaned them our slums up, and these kids were desperate, and they so they joined here. It's better to take your chances, get an eye popped out. And starving to death or the humiliation of being poor. They joined gangs. Um, anyway, Soroka leaves. He goes for the Eastman gang. One day, Soroka, our friend Chick Tricker, um, do you believe the names of this thing? They take the gang leader, Jack Zellick, and they go to rob a bank. Uh, no, it was a grocery store. And the grocery store guy's got a gun, and there's a shootout, and he shoots Zellig, and Soroka and Tricker run for it, and they leave him there. And Zellick gets arrested and he's got a post bomb, but he's got deep connections. Tammany Hall needs him. So Tammany Hall makes sure the charges are dropped. But now Zellick is pissed. They left him there bleeding on the street. He is not happy. So he sends he sends word out, we're going to kill Soroka. We're going to kill Tricker. To defend themselves, Soroka and Tricker found this guy named Jules Morello. And they gave him a gun. They said, listen, go kill Zellig. Can you imagine how stupid this guy Morello must have been? I mean, somebody gives you a gun. They said, look, go kill the most powerful gang leader in North America uh, who's surrounded by murderous thugs and, uh, and let us know how it goes. Anyway, obviously, Zellig found out and he kills Morello uh, at the Stuvitz uh, Casino Hall on December 2, 1911. It's Stuyvesant, by the way. Uh, the murderer, so that strike, that sparks a further shooting war. Zellig is eventually killed in this thing in 1912. But Soroka and Tricker, they tried to take over the entire Eastman gang, uh, what was left of it because it was slowly being destroyed. There was an internal war. Soroka leaves eventually because the Eastmans are just falling apart and there's one war within the war after another one. So he starts his own gang and he goes into the strike breaking, strike breaking business and labor sluggers. Bear in mind now, New York at that time, it's hard to imagine, but it was a lot of factories because, you know, late cheap labor, the ports were there. We made things in those days and we exported them across not only the U.S., but into Europe. So there were a lot of factories. Uh, and again, a lot of cheap labor, the same kids who were joining these gangs, their parents were working in these factories. But they were Europeans and they came with a tradition of unionism and they started to organize. Well, competing with Sirocco's gang was a gang run by a guy named Benny Fine, who was called Dopey Benny Fine. Uh, he was hardly dopey. He was, uh, was in a street gang. I think he may have been with the Eastmans early on. But anyway, a brick was thrown and it hit him and slashed his eyeball and down across. So he had his eye drooped and hence Dopey Benny Fine. Um, so, but his gang was enormous and he was a very good gang leader. He knew what he was doing. So Siroka and him, Dopey Benny, they're fighting for the labor slugging market on the east side of New York. It's around in the 1910s now. So 1913, the two gangs get into a big 
shootout. They were both hired by the Feldman Hat Company, to strike breakers. The union, the people who were forming the union, the workers, also went out and hired a bunch of independent guys, thugs, to fight Benny, Dopey Benny Fine and Sirocco. So you got three gangs shooting each other, plus you got the workers themselves. It was, it was pretty bad. And the first day, there was a huge gunfight in front of one factory. Max Greenwald, who was Benny's, Benny Fine's lieutenant, he gets killed. Benny Fine, he plans to ambush and eliminate Sor Soroka uh, when they attend a dance hall. It's called Arlington Hall on uh, January 9, 1914. I'm going to say that Arlington Hall is today um, on street level. I think it's the same place as the Ukrainian restaurant where I ate in Manhattan. I might be wrong, but I think it's the, and upstairs is the Ukrainian information bureau or something like that. Um, I might be wrong, but I think it is. I think there's certainly the building is still there. Anyway, there's this ambush that turns into a major gun battle between Dopey Benny's guys and Sirocco's guys. And it goes, bounces from street to street downtown in New York for several hours. This is before, you know, there was a central emergency number where a cop could call in backup. It did work that way. So the cops are there shooting, the gangs are shooting each other. It's a lunatic asylum. Remarkably, nobody gets killed. None of the bad guys get killed. But there's a clerk of a court uh, named Frederick Strauss. He was running for dear life. He gets killed by mistake in this crossfire. People are outraged at this. They're just outraged. So the gangs are starting to fall apart, internal warfare, uh, Factories are coming to recognize them. You know, maybe we should just let these people unionize and pay them a living wage and don't make them work 60 hours a week, seven days a week with no time off, no help, and nothing. It was horrible. They were truly sweat factories. By the way, when I was a boy, there were still, I, there might still be today, I don't think there are, but there were still factories, sizable size factories downtown, down in Manhattan. And over in Brooklyn, there was a a handkerchief place. It was a hat place. They made scarves. I think in Manhattan they made women's shirts. Uh, but anyway, back then there were a lot of these factories. So what happens with this enormous crackdown where even the governor says he's going to step in and do something? Uh, Soroka simply vanishes. He falls off the face of the earth. Nobody knows what happened to him. I tried to follow him through on, uh, couldn't find him in the newspapers. He probably changed his name. The name S R I O C C O Siroka. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to spell that, so I couldn't find it. But anyway, Trick Tricker manages to survive, and he takes a fraction of what had been the Eastman Gang, and he heads his own little gang there. Uh, and they hang out. He buys a place called the Stag Cafe. He renamed it the Maryland Cafe. It never took him. It was a Stag Cafe. It was at West 28th Street near Broadway. The building is still there, remarkably. Uh, three years before that, uh, while, he, while he owned this place, there was something, this is remarkable, it's called the Ida the Goose War. Ida the Goose was, um, I, her name was Ida, and she was a showgirl, or a prostitute probably, and she was with one of Tricker's guys, and um, she got involved with the Gopher Gang, see how that works in, Gophers, Goof, Goose. And who knows, you know, two hotheads started shooting at each other. The gopher gang steals her and makes off with her. Uh, Tricker's guys go after There's another shooting, um, leave six people dead in one night. Anyway, 1913, no, April 13, 1913, uh, Chick Tricker is shot to death by members of the Kenmar Street Gang. He was trying to.